Hi beauties, happy Halloween. We have officially made it to the big day. The end of our Halloween week is upon us. I am here for the very final look of the Halloween week series. It has been a long daunting process and let me tell you, there were some times when I wasn't sure it was gonna get done, but we did it. We're here, seven videos. I hope you guys have enjoyed them. So for today's video, this was actually the video that I first conceptualized and it has changed so many times since me first thinking about it, probably in early September about what I wanted to do for Halloween. It started off, it was gonna be an Area 51 story and I was gonna do an alien look and then I didn't have a concept for an alien cause there, it's like such an arbitrary thing. And I was like, okay, well, I still like the idea of doing something alien related. So, and I, but I didn't like the story of Area 51 either. So then I was thinking about Dan Aykroyd's alien experience. And then I stumbled, as I was doing research, I stumbled upon the realization that I needed to just start at the biggest case. As a historian, it is so important whether you believe in aliens or not. I was like, let's talk about this case. So this is the case of Betty and Barney Hill. They are the first publicized abduction uh, in American history, pretty much in, in world history. It's one of those big cases that just revolutionized what it was um, to talk about alien abductions. And it, it honestly has a lot of really feasibly plausible evidence to support the fact that they were actually taken aboard an aircraft. From extraterrestrials, they were taken upon a UFO. They were tested. So yeah, it's a really interesting story. There's a ton of information on it. I tried to get um, the most amount of information to you guys in a very concise way. So I'm definitely missing some stuff because there's a, there's a lot out there. Now, because I didn't have a concept for the alien, I decided instead I would do galaxy makeup. It's very simple to do a lot of blues, purples, some stars and stuff. So I figured I probably couldn't mess it up too bad. I decided let's do that. Because of that, I was trying to think about what outfit wise it would work. I decided to use the blue wig because the blue wig is amazing, so why would I not use it? So we got the blue wig. My little scrunchie's kind of galaxy-ish. My little thing is kind of galaxy-ish. But I didn't have any clothes for it, so I just went with my uh, my good old grumpy cat moon shirt. I figured that would work, and then I'm just all black other than that, so I guess I'm like a black hole and there'll be some galaxy on my face. Yeah, that's the thought. And because of it, I'm not really talking about the makeup you guys know with this series, but I did, I got a couple other palettes too, but I did use, I decided to use the uh, the Galaxy Chic palette from BH Cosmetics and the uh, Constellation palette from uh, Makeup Revolution. That actually, both of these covers are gonna kinda help me get a feel for what I wanna do on my face, my facial area. I did figure out how to do better this, the makeup trick to make your eyebrow get covered. It's not perfect, but I, I watched a tutorial and I said I think I can do it better. So I did it as a test, it worked out pretty well. This side is gonna be glam. So we're gonna do normal glam and then this side of the face is gonna be constellation. And I put on the wig early because I didn't wanna go, I was gonna go all the way up to my forehead and I was like, this wig is gonna cover it. But unfortunately the way I have the thing set, like you very possibly may see the wig band at some point. And if you do, um, I'm sorry, just suspend your belief and pretend that this is my actual blue hair. Anyway, let's let's do this, okay. Do I, just as a start, do I believe in aliens personally? Absolutely, I really do. Um, I don't have any question really about whether or not they exist. Um, I know it is a, a big topic of question for a lot of people. But um, to me, I think it's, it's almost crazy to think that we're in this huge solar system and there's nobody else out there and that we, we're, as humans, the most advanced. I don't believe that at all. So do I think it's possible that they've already made contact with us? Uh, yeah, I think it's highly probable. So yeah, just as a backstory, you guys don't have to agree with me. You do not have to agree with me at all. Um, but that is how I feel about the situation. Um, my Nana, my mom's mom, had an experience that she told me about when I was little. My mom had a pretty significant experience that she's told me about several times. So that's definitely, you know, influenced my decision to uh, to believe as well. But I think even without their encounters, I would still be a pretty significant believer in, um, in extraterrestrials. Oh God, doing this with this particular wig is going to be an absolute nightmare, but we will, we will persist. So yeah, I believe and uh, I have several fam family members who have pretty um, interesting experiences, which I may tell you guys later, it's just we just don't have time to get in it today. So the Betty and the Barney Hill case was the first majorly publicized case of alien encounter um, especially alien abduction. That was almost, I mean, I don't think anybody had come out and really talked about it being abducted or taken apart a craft until this case happens. And this was in September of 1961. 
It happened basically at the uh, the tail end of the 19th into the early morning of the 20th uh, of that September. Betty and Barney Hill were a recently married young biracial couple. And I only point out the fact that they were a biracial couple because this also added to the case a lot. Um, of course, 1961, we're in the middle of the civil rights movement. Um, biracial couples are really not widely accepted by anybody really. I mean, there's a, obviously people who are fighting for the civil rights movements are trying to make things like that more normalized, but it definitely still was a huge issue in the day. Part of it is, you know, a big question and it was their legitimacy. How much can we trust them? How credible are they? Uh, when it came time to decide if this is something we should believe or not. Big point to everybody was why would they bring this kind of negative attention upon themselves when they're already dealing with so many other issues in terms of what society was in that day. So it, to me, I, why would you? You're already fighting enough battles. Why would you add this kind of media storm over something that like, unless you really believe it and you're really trying to like find the answers to it, why would you do that to yourself? So anyway, yes, point that out. Now let's go all the way down to def defining encounter types, because I think that is important as well. There are four types of alien encounters, and I found a really good website that laid them out. So the first, the encounter, it's all close encounters of the first kind, of the first kind. Uh, basically, there's a close range vis visual. Um, they witness, uh, can, the witness observes the UFO, but there is no interaction with either the environment or the witness themselves. So they're aware that the UFO is there, but um, they're not taken, they're not trying to be communicated with, uh, no trees or anything are disturbed, it's just something in the sky that is noticed by a witness on the earth. Second kind is uh, interaction, so it has to include some sort of degree of uh, stimulus and response between the UFO and the person witnessing it. A lot of times things like interferences with electrical items or plants or animals or people, things like that, they'll notice disturbances. Animals will a lot of times um, be unsettled. Electrical uh, issues seems to be a really big one uh, throughout these kind of interactions. It just has to have some sort of impact on the surrounding areas. Okay, the third kind is communication. So aliens either on land or in the craft come to, into close contact with a human. Um, the alien normally initiates the contact, obviously. Uh, and the person could be or could not be aware of the communication uh, being done upon them. And then the fourth kind is the kind that Betty and Barney Hill experienced, and that is abduction. The human is abducted um, by the aircraft itself or the occupants of the um, unknown flying object, and then they are taken, normally taken on board. Um, these are extremely rare, uh, and it's <laughs> the, the blog I read, which was very interesting, said that it was also illegal. And I was like, what does that mean? If, like, well, because it's abducting somebody? Like, well, yeah, but like, what, what are we gonna do? Persecute, like, prosecute, we're gonna arrest the aliens? Like, I'm just confused. So yes, let's jump now into the uh, Betty and Barney Hill case. Like I said, this was in 1961 in September. Betty and Barney had been married for just over a year and had never taken any sort of a honeymoon because um, they both uh, were very hard workers. They dedicated most of their free time to the church and to the civil rights movement. So they really didn't have um, a lot of time to go off and do stuff like that. Um, Betty was a social worker and Barney was a postal worker. So they had um, a long weekend together and they opted to go ahead and take an impromptu trip with just uh, the money that they had in their pockets up to Canada, because of course in New Hampshire, you're very close to the border. So they drove up to Canada and they just took like a three day little long weekend vacation. And this was the final night of that vacation. They were on their way home. And around 10 PM, they stopped at a diner in Vermont and had dinner. And then they were getting back on the road, hoping to be back to their homes by like two in the morning. So the events that took place that night, it was a very interesting article. Um, Betty graduated from the University of New Hampshire and of course that's where they were. So there's a lot of information on their website about this particular case because of how important it is to that area. And because of that, the university had a lot of articles that I was reading to find the information I wanted for this case. 
And one of the things that they said was what happened that night would be known as the first well-documented, feasibly legitimate UFO abduction in history. So that's why this case is so important, whether you believe or not, it has completely changed the dialogue around potential UFO abductions. They're driving home, they're on the interstate, and they start to notice lights in the sky. And at first they think it's just a satellite or maybe um, some sort of an aircraft that had gone off route, but then they realize like, okay, well this can't be commercial. Um, just for some backstory, Barney was a World War II vet and he was an airplane enthusiast. So he had a lot of knowledge about um, different military planes and commercial planes and things like that. So he was pretty positive that it wasn't any sort of commercial aircraft, but he was like, I mean, maybe it's something from the government that they just are testing out, but they really weren't sure. This light, it seems to be following them. Like it doesn't seem to be going in a different direction. It doesn't seem to be going in a straight line. It kind of, or well, it would be a straight line because we're on the highway, but it doesn't seem to be like going anywhere besides where they're going. So they're kind of getting freaked out by it. Okay, so after they've been followed for a good amount of time, they decide they're gonna pull over so that Barney can take a pair of binoculars he had in the car and try and see exactly what we're dealing with here. Like what's happening, what is, what is going on? Barney gets out of the car and through binoculars, they can see a round flat craft with a ring of lights, the flying saucer image, the standard flying saucer image. They don't know what it possibly could be. They have no answers. Like this can't be a satellite. This, I don't know what on earth we're dealing with here because it just is not like anything that they are aware exists. And Barney was described as a very pragmatic and in intelligent intellectual man who, um, who didn't believe in this kind of stuff at all, but didn't really have another explanation for what they were witnessing. So they get pretty freaked out and they decide um, they need to be back on the road. They need to be moving. So they start trying to outrun this. They really thought at this point that it was something that was coming for them. They didn't know why, they didn't know what, but they just were very, very certain that this was not going to end well if it caught up to them. They really try and, um, and do their best to outrun the ring of lights and the ring of lights is just steady keeping up with them. Doesn't matter like how far away it seems like it is, it's always right in their line of vision. When they reached route three, in Lincoln, they uh, they said that the object reportedly just hovered there for a good while, and it was only about 100 feet above their car. So you think 100 feet is nothing. So it's really damn close to them, and they're just really, really uncertain as to what's gonna wind up happening with this whole situation. Barney decides he's going to uh, get his pistol out of the car, once again got out, um, but he found that he just couldn't actually physically lift the pistol when he was trying to aim it. So he, of course, got unsettled once more and decided his best option would be to get back into the car and they just need to um, keep driving as fast as possible to get the hell out of there. They both recall hearing a very loud thump um, from the trunk and then they began to grow sleepy and lost consciousness. And then hours go by and they woke up about 30 miles down the road from where they last remembered being in the car. They had no recollection of anything that happened. Um, they kind of could remember some of the stuff like the being chased and all of that, but they really couldn't remember what was what happened after that. Like wh where, where did they go? They had no idea what happened in this time, but they knew that it was, <laughs> it wasn't good. I don't know what else to say. They, they both were very, um, unsettled by everything that they had experienced. Okay, so they didn't, the reason they knew whatever happened, one was real and two wasn't good, was because uh, they both had physical evidence of disturbances on their body. So Betty's dress was significantly ripped and dirty and Barney's I, relatively new shoes from everything I read was like, they were like in good condition, they were nice shoes, had scuff marks on the toe like he had been dragged. They start to see this and they're trying to figure out what exactly happened while they were unconscious, but they knew it had to be something significant. It had to be some sort of traumatic event uh, because they also both started exhibiting PTSD signs. Nightmares would happen almost nightly for them. 
and they were both very similar. So they would have these nightmares and they would have um, almost identical dreams with things happening, like being surrounded on a table by men that they didn't recognize in these black suits and stuff like that. And they were like, something happened. We, we experienced something. We're not sure what it was that we experienced, but definitely something has gone down and we need to try and figure out what it is. So they begin to research um, they begin to spend time at the library. They start looking into the NICAP, which is the National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, which is a civilian UFO group where they um, try and, and come up with a culmination of different experiences and things um, that prove the existence of alien life. Um, and Barney really, in particular, was not um, well after this experience. He exhibited classic PTSD signs much more severely than Betty did, even though she was also having similar experiences. Um, but he was having like nightly night terrors. Um, he had really horrible anxiety. It was infecting uh, his whole life. He was not sleeping. He ju it was just really, really bad. Finally, after trying to deal with this for about a year, um, they decide to begin to seek help from a psychiatrist by the name of Benjamin Simon. And Benjamin Simon was um, really doing a great job making waves in the um, hypnosis, which was becoming a very popular technique for therapy during this time. He was a really big influencer in the hypnosis regression therapy studying. So as they begin to work with Dr. Simon, Betty and Barney, um, they unearth almost identical yet very distinct versions of this, a very similar encounter, um, which makes a lot of people argue that this is unquestionably real because they were not being treated together. They were not being interviewed together. Um, they were in separate rooms and, and each of their treatments was, was being done at different times, but they were coming up with almost identical cases of what they believed took place on that night. Okay, so much happened off camera. Um, I ultimately decided in order to do the constellation pattern, I was going to have to use this. We brought this back out and it worked very well. I used that and a very fine eyeliner brush and it seems to be uh, an effective solution. So yay, go team, figure that one out. So back to our story, after everything begins to take place. Um, basically, the, the nice part about this study is we now have a very informative collection of information about just this case. Um, all the other cases and everything that have happened to you, we've got a ton of information from those as well. But from just this case, we have the Betty and Barney Hill papers, which is basically, it is a collection of all of the articles uh, research done by Dr. Simon, um, photos, they were able to, um, during these particular um, regression therapy sessions, they were able to sketch photos and diagrams of the ship and the people aboard the ship. They were able to identify uh, exactly what the extraterrestrials looked like. They were also able to recall a lot of the procedures that were performed upon them. So um, so because of, of what Dr. Simon did, it kind of opened this floodgate and then they were allowed to, um, to collect all of this information um, in what is now known as the Betty and Barney Hill papers. And that is, I believe it's public record for people to be able to go and, and look into themselves. Could be wrong about that. I did, I found a lot of stuff about it, but I never actually saw a copy of it. So what did the Hills uh, discover that they encountered while aboard the craft? Well, so under hypnosis, they remembered that a group of extraterrestrials blocked their car and um, basically uh, carried or dragged them onto the ship, not in an aggressive way, just they had rendered them basically um, unconscious, kind of like what I would imagine being on a really strong sedative would do. They, Barney remembered specifically uh, the beings were bipedal, so they stood on two legs. They were humanoid, uh, which means that they were very uh, similar to our structure generally, um, but different at the same time. They had gray skin, metallic black uniforms, and cat-like eyes, which I believe is a big indicator for uh, a lot of the, the stereotypical images that we have of aliens now. I think this case really kind of helped to design that prototype of the alien. Betty remembered they did a general physical test on both of them. Um, once they were taken onto the ship, 
Betty was brought into one room and Barney was brought into another room and there were, I think they said there were 13 people on board that they counted. One of them was performing the tests on them. One of the men on board, Betty referred to as the leader because he actually was able to communicate with them through um, the English language, but none of the other ones spoke in a way that they could understand. I don't know exactly how they were speaking, but it wasn't any language that either one of them recognized. At one point, they were doing a lot of just general testing, things like um, one interesting thing that Betty said was that uh, they were doing, they were looking in their mouths and stuff like that. And at one point, she had a name for him and I don't know why I can't remember. Like she called the leader, the one who talked to them, the leader. She had a name for uh, this particular one too, the one who was doing the tests on them, but I can't remember. It was like the examiner maybe. I don't remember, I, I didn't write that down, I'm so sorry. She remembered him running into her room from Barney's room and checked her teeth. And she was like, uh, she asked what they were doing. Uh, he asked the leader to ask her why Barney's teeth were removable, but hers were not. And it was because Barney had dentures. So it's very interesting, the things that they recalled from this. She was given a pregnancy test that actually went through the navel, it was a long needle that they inserted into her navel and they told her it would not hurt. As soon as they started it, she began to scream because it was incredibly painful. And the leader actually came over and laid his hand on her forehead and her pain ceased. And Betty told them, that's not like any pregnancy test that we have. But actually a few years after this incident happened, then they began to do uh, certain pregnancy tests and test uh, for pregnancy and fetal health through the navel using a large needle. So. A lot of people have also said like, how would she know about this technology? She, she was a social worker, she wasn't in the medical industry, so why, how would she know that this technology was something that was even possible? That seems like a legitimate ass question to me. I don't know, how would she know, but whatever. What followed this case was a media storm. It was a frenzy. In order to escape the, um, the attention of the, the media, the circus that was ensuing around them, they actually stayed with family for a while. Uh, they were they were just trying to, to exist normally and also still uncover what they had been through. It put an extra amount of strain on them because they're already dealing with a lot of social issues as a couple. Their credibility is being tested. People are supporting them. People are going against them. People are saying they're crazy. People are saying that they're they're lucky because they've got to experience this. And both of them are still trying to deal with what they have gone through. Oh, this is the Ciate, Lust the Ciate London Eye Luster um, Liquid Eyeshadow, and I got it, I, this is a tangent, I got it in my BoxyCharm add-on. I, I did it on the BoxyCharm add-on sale because I had gotten a pink one from BoxyCharm like a year ago, and it's my favorite, and oh my god, I, this is the first time I'm using it. I used it here, you guys can see it gets reflected, but oh my god, it's, god, it's beautiful. Anyway, sorry about that just had to had to point that out gorgeous love it so it just they were their credibility was being checked they were being supported in some ways they were being constantly wanted to be interviewed and people you know really just were fascinated by this case but also very critical of it so it was a lot for them to deal with unfortunately barney um he suffered his health suffered drastically from this uh, experience. On February 25th of 1969, he actually had an aneurysm and only seven and a half years after the incident, he died at the age of 46. To me, personally, researching this, looking into the case, I think that it has everything to do with the experience he had. I don't think he would have passed at that age if he hadn't had. Now, I don't know if it's something that happened to him on the craft that caused this. I don't know if it was just the stress of trying to cope with it and the, the repercussions of the PTSD and everything, but I think that this directly related to his untimely death. Um, and I say untimely, I mean, he died of natural causes, but I just think that it was suspicious. Betty actually lived to be 85. She didn't die until 2004, and she continued for the rest of her life to work towards bringing awareness of uh, aliens and, and to study and to figure out what exactly um, happened to her and Barney that night. I think the saddest part for me is that by all accounts, Betty and Barney were very in love and, and for her to lose him at such a young age because of this incident is really tragic in my opinion. But she did continue the, her whole life. She talked about it. She's very open about it. She talked about what they had experienced. She's very confident in, in what, what they had lived through and she was willing to share and talk to people about it. And I loved, I loved that. I think that was really important. It's, it's definitely made this case what it is. I mean, there's tons of movies, a lot of movies, a lot of alien literature and, and show and stuff is based off of this encounter. I know there's, there's a couple movies I can't think of them offhand. 
I didn't write them down, I'm sorry. But there's there's a lot, a lot. And then Betty's niece, Kathleen Martin, uh, who's a school teacher, she actually has dedicated a great deal of her life and free time to the research and um, the culmination of information about extraterrestrials as well. Uh, she was 13 when this incident happened and she remembers vividly Betty calling her mother and saying, I, I think we had, Bernie and I had an experience. We can't, we don't know what's happening, but we're neither one of us are okay. And we were pretty sure we were taken by aliens. And it was such a, a drastic thing for the entire family that Kathleen has, um, she's written a book on it. She has assembled like a 78 page uh, PDF file that is open to the public, um, done as a, as a presentation um, on why the existence of extraterrestrials is not only feasible, but uh, we have evidence of it as well. It's just a very fascinating case. Um, one of the last things I'm gonna mention about it, the military and uh, very high up military personnel and a lot of really well-known scientists were fascinated by the information that the Hills had, had gathered. They were interviewed, they were uh, talked to by countless people. People who, I would think it says, uh, if they're interested in you, it means that you've got information that they want. So to me, uh, it also legitimizes everything that they went through and, and their claims and, and you know their experience as a whole. And I think, I think unquestionably, if you listen, because the nice thing about the, uh, the sessions with Dr. Simon is they are recorded. Um, you can listen to them and a lot of documentaries and stuff like that. You can hear them while they're in their hypnosis state. It's very upsetting that what they, what they are saying they know happened to them. Um, now people question whether or not it's true, but they think that they, I think most people agree that they believe this happened. They just are not sure if it should be believed or not. I think everybody pretty much agrees that they believe this happens. It's just whether or not they were crazy is kind of what people said. Are they crazy? Are they insane? Or did this act, was this a real event that took place? So that is the Betty and Barney Hill story. There is so much information on it. If, I really encourage you guys look up some documentaries, look up the, the, definitely look up the tapes. The tapes are fascinating. And that's a look. Actually, this one came together really nicely. I'm very happy with how this one turned out. Um, I was worried for a hot second, but we, we made it all work. So yeah, that's the look. We did it. We did it seven days. I can't believe we did seven, seven days. I can't believe we did it. I, I literally, I, this from like conjuring it in my, my mind to making it happen, it took like 20 days to do, uh, insane. I, I was so much research. It was so much like trying to come up with costumes and, and makeup ideas or whatever. Um, not everything turned out the way I wanted it to. Um, I will get better with my storytelling and my makeup. That's, a, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to improve and hopefully, you guys enjoyed the ride and you're ready to buckle up and continue on this journey with me. So yeah, thank you guys for doing this with me. Halloween is my favorite holiday. So I think I, you know, I think with 2020 being the way it, it has, I needed to do this. It helped in a lot of ways. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. So you see every time I do something insane like this. And other than that, I hope you guys are all safe, healthy. You have a wonderful Halloween. Be safe, make good choices and you stay girly with a dark twist.